and we're going to go boy, girl, boy, girl, so it's fair. Uh, and, or girl, boy, girl, boy, that's fine. See? And <laughs> she said, girl, girl, girl. Now, nah, that's not fair. Come on. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, you know, people just raise their hands. I will call on you a couple things. Wait till the mic gets there. Number two, introduce yourself so we know who you are. Number three, if you keep your question or comment relatively short, then my response, I, w I can't guarantee I'll keep it short, but I'll keep it shorter. Uh, and that way we have a chance to hear from more people. All right? Okay, so let's, let's see who's going to go first. Where's my, where's my mic? Here we go. All right, I'll, uh, let's see. That's a good looking crowd, too. I, I, I'm, I, I, oh, I, I, I don't know who to call on. That young lady right there in the, in the, in the brown jacket, right there. Yes, you. Okay, hold on, wait for the mic. You didn't follow instructions. You're already. Careful, careful. She didn't go McKinley, is that what happened? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, go ahead. My name is Rachel. I'm from Texas. And my question, I don't have one. I just want to tell you thank you. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that's sweet. You got it. All right. The, well, I, she just, she didn't really have a question. So I'm going to go back. To, I'm going to go to this young lady right here in the, in the black and white jacket. Right there. Hold on a second. This, this. The mic's coming to you. It's just we're so packed in, it may take. You, you can go ahead and pass her the mic. Yay. She looks like she'll give it back. Hi, <laughs> Hi, Mr. President. My name is Jasmine Elliott, and I am a 10th grade cheerleader here at McKinley High School. Yeah, all right. Go Panthers. And I love you. Me and my family love you so much. Oh, I want that's to thank sweet. you. And um, as a future broadcast journalist, I would like to ask you two questions. Okay. My first question is, what are your plans to do when you leave office? Okay. And can you please give my grandmother a hug? <laughs> See, I, now, first of all, I know your grandma put you up to that. So I will give your grandma a hug because you, you did such a nice job asking the question. Um, in, ter in terms of my plans, I, look, I... I've got so much work to do this next year that I, Michelle and I, we haven't had a chance, uh, you know, to really step back and think about it. But as I said at the State of the Union, when I get out, I'm still holding the most important job in a democracy, and that is the office of citizen. So I will continue to work on the things that, you know, Michelle and I care so deeply about. We want to encourage young people to get involved. We want to improve education. We want to make sure that uh, our criminal justice system works the way it should. We want to make sure that uh, we are promoting uh, science education and learning. So uh, we want to work internationally to help uh, other countries uh, develop. So we're going to have a, a busy agenda, but I, I'm not overthinking that right now because I've got a whole bunch of stuff to do between now and next year. All right? But thank you for the question. All right. Uh, it's, a, it's a gentleman's turn. This man, because he got such a sharp bow tie right here. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. This is a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tremaine Sterling. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Through your entire two terms as president, what would be your biggest regret and why? Um, I think it's a great question. Although, had you been watching my State of the Union on Tuesday, <laughs> he might have known that I actually already answered that question. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm sure there was a good ball game on that night. <laughs> no, what, 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 I, what I told the country 
except for you, <laughs> was that my biggest regret was the fact that uh, you know, politics has become more rancorous during my presidency and more polarized than it was when I came in. And, and keep in mind, when I ran, my belief was that there were no red states and blue states. There wasn't a black or white or Latino or America. There, there was a, a United States of America. And, and, and that continues to be my belief. Now, you know, I have, as president, obviously done soul searching about what are things I could do differently to help bridge some of those divides. I think part of it had to do with when I came in, we had a real emergency and we had to act quickly and people in Washington sometimes weren't always as focused on getting the job done as they were, how's this going to uh, position us for future elections and but but I, as I said uh, at the State of the Union, yeah, I, I have no doubt that there are things I could have done better. But what I also say is that this is not something a president can do by him or herself. When, when it comes to how we work together, the, the main uh, impetus for a better politics is going to be the American people. They have to demand it. And so if we have voters who are not getting involved, then the people who tend to determine the agenda are the special interests or money or power or the loudest voices or the most polarizing voices because a lot of folks, some of the best people, they're just sitting at home. And they're getting cynical about politics, they don't get involved, and then the people who do get involved end up being the folks who aren't willing to work together. Um, it's important for voters to insist that their elected officials are strong on principle, but also are willing to compromise with people who don't agree uh, with them. And if, if, you, if you punish uh, an elected official for even talking to the other side, then it's going to produce the kind of politics that we have seen in Washington too often. So this is an area where I regret. I'm going to keep on working at it, try to see what more we can do to reach across the aisle to get things done. I said on Tuesday that I think at the end of last year, maybe we surprised the cynics by getting a budget done and we extended uh, tax cuts for working families that were due to expire and we were able to continue funding for transportation. I know that uh, your mayor was talking about how the interstate here narrows and you know, we may need to do something about it to relieve some traffic. And, uh, and, and those, things, those things are not things that should be subject to a lot of Republican and Democratic argument. Maybe that's something that we can uh, carry over into this year. One area, for example, that there's been genuine bipartisan interest and, and uh, support is the idea that we've got to reform our criminal justice system. That, that we have to be tough on violent crime, but also be smart when we think about how can we prevent young people from getting into the criminal justice system in the first place. How can we provide alternatives for low-level, uh, nonviolent drug offenders? How can we make sure that the sentencing is proportional? How do we make sure that we're training folks while they're incarcerated to get uh, a skill that would allow them to be gainfully employed? How do we make sure that when they are released that there's a transition process for them? Uh, how do we lift up all the outstanding employers who are willing to give people second chances? So there's a whole slew of work that we could be doing there. And, it, you know, to their credit, we've seen some very conservative Republicans 
and some very liberal Democrats sitting down at the table and trying to work it out. And, and that's an example of where we see some promise. Another area uh, is, I, and I mentioned this at the State of the Union, uh, some of you have heard of the Earned Income Tax Credit. Now this is, this is a program historically that is supported by Democrats and Republicans, and it's a pretty simple idea. If you work, you shouldn't be in poverty, and so we should provide tax breaks to low-income working families so that they don't say, I might as well just be on welfare because uh, it, I'll get more benefits than if I'm working. Well, the Earned Income Tax Credit creates an incentive to say, you work hard, you're working full-time, but it's, say, a minimum wage job. We're going to give you a chance, if you've got kids, to raise that income level, get a tax break. The problem is that it does not apply to uh, individuals without children. And, you know, that means a lot of men in that category don't benefit. Uh, and young people don't benefit. And, and one of the things we've been talking about is if we expand that to, uh, to reach workers who don't have children but are also working hard and are in poverty, that could be helpful. And, and these are areas where Cedric, you know, who's, he's been a leader on criminal justice reform. He's working on this as well. Uh, I know that Mitch has been doing great work uh, when it comes to uh, the, you know, the criminal justice system uh, in New Orleans. These are, these are the kinds of areas where just common sense can prevail uh, if we've all got uh, a spirit of, of trying to solve problems instead of just winning elections. Okay? All right. Uh, okay, it's a young lady's turn. Okay. Uh, you know what, I'm going to call on that, that little young lady right there. Yeah. She's in her daddy's lap and, you know, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter is about to go to college next year and And, and I can't really talk about it a lot because I start to cry, so. My name is Noel Remedy, and I'm in fourth grade, and I'm 10 years old. And do you think there's going to be a cure for cancer? Well, there, there you go. The, uh, are, you, uh, are you interested in math and science? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. It's going to be young people like you that are going to help cure cancer. Uh, so you better study up on your math and, and study up on your science. But, uh, but I do think that we are seeing medical breakthroughs right now that we have not seen in my lifetime. Part of the reason is because uh, some of you heard of the Human Genome Project. What happens is that we're now able to look at uh, not just how cells work, but we're actually able to track how individual DNA and, and, and genetics operates. And when you do that, it turns out that a cancer cell that I have may be different than a cancer cell that John or somebody else has and may require different cures and certain treatments might work better than other treatments. And, and because we're able to get into the really nitty gritty of, of how our bodies work in ways that we haven't before, we're starting to see more effective treatments. But we have to make a big investment. Uh, and my Vice President, Joe Biden, who I love, uh, suffered the kind of tragedy last year that uh, is, is un unbelievable. And he, he managed it with grace. His son, Bo Biden, was one of the finest men I knew. Um, and so I thought it was entirely appropriate for Joe Biden, who has seen this and gone through it, to lead this effort uh, like a moon launch. We're going we're to double down on medical research. We're going to look at the best, uh, we're going to gather the best researchers, the best scientists, and we are going to go after this thing. It probably won't be cured in my lifetime. But I think it'll be cured in yours. And that's why we got to get started now. All right? Okay. 
It is a, it's a gentleman's turn. This gentleman back here, right there. Yes, sir, the, you. <laughs> Hold on, the mic's coming, the mic's coming. Mr. President, first of all, I'm Greg Gavins. I'm the proud father of one of your special great Secret Service. Outstanding. I have a question for you. Since you can't run again for another term, is there any way that we as a group can talk the first lady into running? No. <laughs> no. No, no, no. 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 Let me tell you, there are three things that are certain in life. Death, taxes, and Michelle is not running for president. That, that I can tell you. But uh, you know what? The, the first lady, though, uh, the work she's done around reducing childhood obesity, the work that she and Joe Biden have done on military families uh, and making sure they get support. I, I could not be prouder of her, and I, I am certain that she's going to be uh, really active uh, as a first lady. Not only is she going to be a very young ex-first lady, but uh, unlike me, she, act she looks young. Uh, I, I was looking at a wedding picture. No, we, we, actually, we, ha we found uh, the old video from our wedding. We've been, we've been married uh, 23 years now. And, and so my mother-in-law had, had been going through some storage stuff and found the, our, our wedding video. And uh, I popped it in. And I, I, I looked like a teenager. I... I and, and realized, boy, boy, I sure have aged. <laughs> oh, I, I know that, though. <laughs> but Michelle looked, she, she looked identical. Looked identical. Uh, and, well, I am proud of her, too, because most importantly, she's been an unbelievable mom, which is why my daughter's turned out so well. So, all right. Uh, it is a young woman's turn. This is a, this is a young lady right here. Go ahead. Right, yeah, you. Yeah, you've been raising your hand. Okay. But, but hold on, Mike's coming. Go ahead. Oh, oh, hi, my name is Imani Maxberry. I'm a coastal environmental science major at LSU. Outstanding. Um, one, I want to say thank you for rejecting the Keystone Pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, and two, I want to ask, while you've been in office, what environmental impact do you, what environmental issue do you think has impacted you the most and should be more brought to the public? Okay, the, uh, that's a great question, and I'm proud that you're doing that work. That's important. Um, First of all, it's important for us to understand how much environmental progress we've made in my lifetime. And, and, and the reason is sometimes when we talk about the environment, it sounds like something far away. But we don't realize, we don't remember what we've accomplished already. In, in the 1970s, in California, there would be regular days where people did not go outside. When, when, when Ronald Reagan was governor in, 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 law, in, in California, there were regularly days where the smog was so bad, it was like it is in Beijing now, people just wouldn't go outside. And if you had asthma or some respiratory disease, you, you, you might die. I remember as recently as 1979, when I first started college, uh, I, I started college in Los Angeles. When I went running, I, 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 first week I was there, after about five minutes, I'd start feeling a burning in my chest. And it was just me sucking in soot and smog. And now you go there and, and that smog isn't there. 
And the reason is because we institute things like catalytic converters and, and, and unleaded gasoline, and we, we change the technologies to reduce smog. It used to be that places like uh, the Cuyahoga River in, in, in around Cleveland got, caught fire. It was so polluted. Caught fire. No, there's no joke. And now you go there and people are able to use it. Same thing with the Chicago River. Now people are kayaking and fishing. And so, so the point is, is that we actually can make progress when we make an effort because of our technology and our innovation. And a lot of, every time we've made a, uh, taken a step to try to clean up our air or our water or our environment, there are all kinds of people who say, this is going to kill jobs, we can't afford it, can't do it, it's going to cost too much. And then after we do it, we look back and say, you know, it didn't cost as much as we thought. It happened quicker than we did. Our businesses figured out how to do it and to make money doing it at the same time. What a, that, that's what I mean when I say an innovation economy. We've got to be confident about our ability to solve any problem if we put our minds to it. So now the, the, the answer to your question right now is I, I, what I'm very much concerned about is climate change. And I, 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 there are folks who are still de denying that this is a problem or that we can do anything about it. I, I, look, if, if 99 doctors told you that you have diabetes, and you need to change your eating habits and get some exercise and lose some weight, you, you may decide not to do it because you're, you're stubborn, but don't say they're wrong because the science is unsure. This is happening. And by the way, if you live in Louisiana, you should especially be concerned about this because you are right next to some water that has a tendency to heat up and that then creates hurricanes and as oceans ride that means that the amount of land that is getting gobbled up continuously in this state is shrinking the, the, the land mass and it's going to have an impact. Now we can build things and we can fortify things and we can do things smarter and we can control how development happens and we can restore wetlands. All those things make a difference. But ultimately we got to do something about making sure that ocean levels don't rise four, five, six, eight feet. Because if they do, this, this state's going to have some big problems, bigger problems. So what we've done is we've gotten together with 200 other nations, American leadership, to say all of us have to start bringing down the carbon pollution that we send in the atmosphere. And here in the United States, there are two main ways we can do that. Number one is our power plants, we've got to start using cleaner energy. Number two, we've got to start promoting uh, solar and wind, which create jobs. And we're a leader in this technology as long as we start uh, investing in it. You know, and that transition from old dirty fuels to clean fuels, that's going to be tough. A lot of people make money in, in the coal industry, for example. A lot of people have, have worked there historically. But now you actually have more people working in solar than you do in coal. Those communities that are reliant on coal, we should help them get a jump on making money in wind power and solar power. Those are hard-working, good people. Let's not have them stuck in old jobs that are going to be slowly declining. Let's get them in the new jobs that are going to be going up. And then in our transportation sector, we need to continue to uh, build on the things we've done since I've been president, doubling fuel efficiency standards on cars, promoting electric cars. All this stuff adds up. Uh, and the good news is businesses can succeed and we can make money doing it at the same time. But don't think that this is not a problem for all of us. That th this is the main message I have. You know, 
we talked, that young lady was asking me about curing cancer. Well, we, we might cure cancer, but if temperatures have gone up two, three degrees around the planet, four degrees, and oceans are rising, we've got, we're going to have more problems than, than uh, medical science can cure. We've got to make that investment now, and we can do it. All right. Good question. Uh, this gentleman right here. Hold on. I've got a mic right there. How you doing? I, I can hold it. I'm, Go ahead. I'm a big kid. Well, maybe I'm not a big kid. Okay. Go uh, ahead. My name is Alan Turr. I'm from near Youngstown, Ohio. You've been here many times in helping with the uh, steel mills get back on track. That's all good. Right. And in your defense, um, my business is doing good, making money. Good. Growing for the last 10 years. And I got a lot of friends that have businesses. They're doing real well, too. So for a lot of people that are complaining, there's a lot of people doing well. So I think if you hustle, you can make, make good. Absolutely. But my question to you is, you're on your last year. Is there any one big thing that you'd like to see happen before you leave the office? Good. The, uh, well, first of all, what's your business? Well, I got a couple businesses. Uh, I manufacture Halloween props. And I own a haunted house in Hayride in Lordstown, Ohio, which you've been there many been, times, yeah. to the car plant, called Fear Forest. Maybe if you make it uh, in, back in the Youngstown uh, in October, you can come check it out. But I make Halloween props, and I like to scare people. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of interesting. That, that's fun. The, uh, y you sell a lot of Obama masks? Hey, Obama's not scary, so... Yeah, there you go. All right. I don't think so. I, um... The, the things that I, I talked about uh, in the State of the Union are all things that I think are possible. Some of them I can get done on my own. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, we need to revamp how uh, our information systems, our IT systems and government work. This is the, one of the areas where we're, the, there's a biggest gap between government and the private sector is, you know, if you just want to order a pizza, you've got your smartphone and you just, and the pizza shows up. Yeah, you want to buy an airline ticket, you know, you punch in a couple things and Suddenly, if you go to the airport, it's all printing out. And the systems in government are really old. Now, that causes two problems. Number one is they're less safe and secure than they should be because they're old. They're outdated systems. So it's easier for folks to try to hack into them, break into them, and we're constantly putting patches up. Uh, the second thing is it just means that things are slower for customers. And I want to make sure government is in the 21st century and... You know, we're systematically going agency through agency. If, if you want to get a small business loan from the SBA, I want you to be able to go to one website in English, be able to figure out what you need to do, apply online, get that money, start that business, put people to work. And right now, we're, 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 we're continually trying to streamline that process. Uh, and we've made some good progress. Uh, but that's an example of something that we can do administratively. The same is true, by the way, for the VA. You'll remember, we, for, we are so proud of our veterans and our young men and women who served. And we got some folks here looking sharp in uniform that we are grateful for uh, their service. And, and we have put more resources and provided more support to an increased budgets for the VA than any administration in history. We have cut backlogs. We included folks who had been affected by Agent Orange. We have boosted uh, the, the resources available for folks suffering from PTSD. We are ending veterans' homelessness. We've made some human, huge investments, made really good progress. But you'll remember that story that came out last year or a year and a half ago in Phoenix, where folks were waiting so long to try to get an appointment that, and many of these were 
elderly, aging folks, and they were dying before they got an appointment. And it was unacceptable. When we did an investigation of what had happened, and what was worse was some of the administrators there were hiding what was going on and manipulating sort of records in ways that meant they had to be fired. But when you looked at what was going on, a lot of it had to do with the fact that they had a system where a veteran would call in trying to get an appointment, somebody was writing it down on paper, then they were tapping it into some 30-year-old computer system that would then print out something that then would get walked over to some place that then they'd have to... Ma it was a mess. And so we've had to make big investments in trying to clean up that whole process. So that's what we can do without Congress. Some things I think we can do with Congress I've already mentioned. I think we can get criminal justice reform passed. I think that we can potentially do some work on uh, what I, I just uh, identified, the earned income tax credit that would help uh, millions of people around the country who are working hard get out of poverty. And on the issue of medicine, I think that we, we're seeing some bipartisan work to try to bring together all the resources we have around these these new medical breakthroughs uh, that could potentially not just affect uh, things like cancer, but also Alzheimer and Parkinson's and a lot of diseases that people suffer from. It, it's a good story, and it's not as politically controversial as some other issues. Now, there's some things I'd love to do, like raising the minimum wage all, for everybody. Um, I'd love to get immigration reform passed, but but I'm realistic that Congress probably will not act on some of those more controversial issues. That's where people are going to have to make a decision uh, you know, in this election. You know, that's what elections are about. You've got to decide uh, which, which direction America needs to go in. Okay. Uh,